We're going to get started. Uh, this presentation has become a tradition of sorts uh, at the OpenStack Summit. I think it's the, the third time uh, that uh, we're doing this. Uh, we're calling this the high availability update. As we can see from the turnout here today, we have a significant portion of the OpenStack user community that is very interested in high availability and in following the progress that OpenStack is making in the high availability field. And what we would like uh, to present to you today is a brief overview of the recent changes and additions and improvements made to OpenStack in the recently dropped Havana release and a bit of an outlook as to what we can hope for in terms of high availability for uh, Icehouse. And here is where this thing is failing us. And will that work? No. Carry on, say it. I'll fix this. So uh, as we heard yesterday in the keynote that two thirds of the people are new here. So you must be asking this question, who the heck are these guys? So let me introduce you to Florian Haas. He is the CTO, CEO and principal consultant at Hastexo. He is the, one of the most sought after high ability guys in the OpenStack environment. Whoops, that was too quick. Uh, no, I got it, it's fine. Take your, take your hands off the keyboard, okay. we're good. Um, and this is uh, Said Armani. Uh, Said Armani is a guy that works for us out of uh, Delhi, India. He joined us this year and uh, I'm very happy to have hired him because he's, I think, one of the most brilliant minds in the Indian uh, OpenStack community. And we're very lucky to have him and he's with us as a, as a senior consultant. Um, and he has gotten his hands dirty on a number of high availability OpenStack projects this year. So I'm very happy to have him with me on stage. This is commonly what we do not want, right? This is the kind of stuff that we want to protect against. And uh, at a certain scale, uh, some failure is inevitable. At scale, something will always fail. So uh, the real challenge for high availability in OpenStack, or in any cloud platform, really, is how do we make sure that an individual hardware or software failure does not affect our user-facing service, does not generate downtime for our user-facing services, and it is ultimately high availability that gets us there. And what we want to start with uh, today is, as always, as we're doing here for the third time at this summit, we want to start with talking about high availability and the changes in high availability at the OpenStack infrastructure layer. And uh, as you know, infrastructure layer is, are those services which basically underpins an OpenStack cloud. These services are some services which are created by OpenStack and some services are that we merely consume, like the database and the MQP and whatnot. So infrastructure is high availability for OpenStack infrastructure services like API services, MQP, we are RabbitMQ, and, and those sort, sort of things. And that, of course, includes the API service, the OpenStack API services themselves as well. So we're really talking about two different categories of services. Uh, we're talking about, um, on the one hand, services that are essential for OpenStack to function, but not part of the OpenStack code base proper. So examples for that would be our relational database management system. Most people use MySQL, but Postgres and other uh, backends are also supported. Um, the uh, AMQP service, most people will be using RabbitMQ. Cupid is also supported. ZeroMQ has some support for specific OpenStack services. Uh, and on the other hand, we're also talking about those services that, that underpin an OpenStack cloud that are part of the OpenStack core code base, uh, such as, for example, all of our API services, controller services, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about infrastructure um, and infrastructure high availability specifically to distinguish it from the high availability of uh, OpenStack guests, so OpenStack virtual machines. And that is a separate topic that we're going to get to near the end of the talk. So here's a change from those of you who may have been sitting in the predecessor version of this presentation in Portland. When we talked about this in Portland, uh, we had five different node types that we needed to consider for uh, high availability purposes. Since then, something important has happened. We have uh, two new integrated OpenStack projects. We've got Heat, which is OpenStack orchestration, 
and we have a Celometer, which is the OpenStack metering and uh, monitoring and whatnot service that we can eventually use for billing and alerts, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than five different node types with two new services, we've got two new node types, and those are here at uh, the bottom of the list. I'm going to go through the full list really quickly. Uh, we typically have some form of a cloud controller node uh, that runs services like, for example, our uh, Glance registry or uh, our Nova scheduler or um, other scheduling and registration services. We've got our API node, which runs one uh, or, well, typically several of the uh, OpenStack RESTful APIs. Those are essentially clever web servers that then interface with the relevant uh, OpenStack components. Uh, we've got the network nodes. Network nodes are the node type that ensures uh, connectivity not only between the individual guests, but also the connectivity of the entire cloud and its tenant networks to the outside world, to the public internet. We have compute nodes. I guess that's a no-brainer in any cloud environment. We need uh, nodes that host hypervisors and then uh, manage and run virtual machines, virtual guests. We've got our storage controller nodes. That's a special one um, that um, manages the uh, Cinder volume uh, and Cinder scheduler services. So anything in uh, Cinder that is not API and not actual storage backend belongs on a storage controller. And then there's the two new ones. Um, so we've got uh, from Celometer, we get a new node type called the metering node. Uh, which is a node that runs, uh, for example, the Celometer central agent. Uh, so it is uh, responsible for collecting various counters and gauges from uh, uh, various uh, bits and pieces of OpenStack. And then we've got our orchestration node. The orchestration node is the node that runs the heat engine. So it runs that component of heat that is actually responsible for uh, implementing uh, stacks as per the uh, definitions in either the heat orchestration templates or AWS CloudFormation templates, depending on what template language, template DSL we want to use. So out of these seven, five are old, two are new, as a result of ongoing development and the new two incubate, uh, integrated projects that we've had in OpenStack that just graduated with, that just um, had their first official release drop with Havana uh, three weeks ago. The good thing about this is, sorry, the good thing about this is for all of these, we can essentially use the same high availability stack to achieve high availability for all of these services, um, except that uh, we only need to configure those stack, uh, that stack in different configurations based on this node type. Uh, for some of these, it makes perfect sense to, for example, have more than two instances of a specific, uh, of a specific service such as the API nodes. They can handle like two or three or four or five different instances for scale out if we need that. Um, for others, it makes more sense to deploy them in an active passive configuration. That high availability stack that we're talking about here is the Pacemaker stack. Pacemaker is sort of the default uh, Linux HA stack and uh, has been exactly that uh, for the last decade or so. So we have reference configurations for Pacemaker OpenStack HA covering all the, nearly all the components. We have this, these resource agents written by Martin. So you can just copy paste, these are cookie, uh, basically cookie cutters. You just copy paste these reference configurations to your system and you can make all your services highly available. And this is one such example of Cloud Controller HA. So you have this Cloud Controller node running your uh, messaging services, AMQP, you could run RabbitMQ or you could run Cupid. And then there's your database, and which is then run by Pacemaker Crossing Cluster. And uh, you can do active as a failovers for that. And now, let's, one thing that we want to get into uh, in a little more detail is database high availability. Um, that is, there we've seen a change not so much in OpenStack itself, but just in terms of the database replication high availability technology that is becoming more and more popular among real world OpenStack users that are interested in HA for a relational database. And for MySQL, that is Galera. Galera is a multi-master replication facility for the MySQL database. 
implementing a technology that it, re it refers to as uh, right set replication, or WS rep. That is becoming the de facto standard for uh, synchronous multi-master replication capability for the MySQL database. And uh, in contrast to legacy uh, options, such as, for example, tossing a MySQL database onto um, the DRBD, which is a dis distributed replicated block device, which is sort of a kernel block replication technology, is um, we can extend our high availability here across more than two nodes. Uh, in, in fact, in Galera, we have to have a minimum of three nodes or two nodes plus an arbitration daemon to ensure, um, to ensure replication and high availability. Um, the good thing here is that we can use it both for, uh, for high availability and for load balancing to a certain extent, simply because uh, when we are replicating MySQL with Galera, uh, we can read from all of the database nodes at any given time, so we have a sort of a natural read scale out. Um, and there is also a certain amount of multi-master write capability, meaning there is the possibility to write to multiple masters at the same time. However, um, in order to ensure uh, consistency, it, of course, means that um, Galera must take care of uh, conflicts uh, internally, which means that inevitably if we're hammering, uh, if we've got a really busy application that are hammering like a dozen different Galera nodes at the same time, some of those transactions will fail, will need to be rolled back because of conflicts and things like that, and that generally tends to drop our average database latency. So what most people do with Galera is uh, they follow a single writer multiple reader approach. And um, another advantage of this solution versus solutions that operate on block replication technology is that at any time the database on all of these um, Galera replication nodes is actually consistent. So on failover, there is no recovery that is necessary for a quote unquote crash database. Instead, it's completely consistent. We can directly fail over and we can immediately start using the database, which is nice because it significantly drops our failover times and therefore it, contr and it contributes to overall availability. RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ. Question. The question was, do I have experience using Postgres? Uh, yes, I have a lot of experience using Postgres in synchronous replication mode, but not with uh, OpenStack clouds specifically. Um, Postgres, as of version 9.1, has a synchronous uh, replication mode that you can use relatively similarly to Galera. I would say that the user base is much smaller than the one from MySQL Galera, and at least in my experience, that is particularly true for people using a database for OpenStack. Um, so by all means, yes, it should work, but I can't offer any specific hands-on experience with Postgres, sync replication, and OpenStack in that combination. If there's someone in the room that can, please raise your, hands, raise your hand now We'll be happy to have a discussion afterward. Do we have a Postgres for OpenStack expert in the room by any chance? Nope. Okay. Then that makes it a question for the mailing list. <laughs> or for IRC. There is plenty of help around. Or for a hallway discussion. Okay. So RabbitMQ is the AMQP implementation that most of the OpenStack deployments are using. And uh, you can make uh, RabbitMQ highly available in two ways. First, you can have active passive clusters of RabbitMQ running. And second, you have mirrored queues. And uh, the down point or the pain point in mirrored queues is that consistency issues. Because in some nodes, you will see duplicate messages. And in some nodes, you will find that the message hasn't arrived. And in case of active passive cluster, you must have the Erlang cookie on every node that, you, uh, that your AMQP or RabbitMQ is running. And uh, the combo is the Python library that's implementing RabbitMQ. Glance multiple image locators. So Glance has implemented this functionality in Havana that you can provide alternate locations for downloading the image. So you just can provide uh, two URLs. So in case if it fails to download uh, the image from one location, it can fail over to the alternate location. 
and cinder back in for glance, so uh, they have now had driver for uh, cinder. So what it does that uh, if your cinder backend is highly available, it's Ceph RBD or something, and your glance is storing your images from the uh, RBD, then it automatically becomes highly available. We had a question at the back. So the question was, are there any comments on uh, zero MQ uh, as, an, uh, as, a, as a message broker service? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I would love uh, for zero MQ to be completely supported and fully available because if you have a completely peer-to-peer -peer, uh, brokerless message bus, then you don't need to worry about failing over the broker state or synchronizing the broker state. Um, is uh, Eric in the room, Eric Windisch? He was here he earlier, was, yeah. but uh, he seems to have left. Uh, he was the guy that wrote most of the uh, zero MQ implementation in OpenStack originally. Um, the uh, zero MQ uh, currently has known issues in the sense that it's not entirely clear whether they've been completely eradicated with the uh, Neutron, DHCP. specifically the Neutron DHCP agent. Um, and apparently um, the sad state of affairs there is that no one has really made the effort to completely stamp out those bugs. So that unfortunately is sort of unchanged from, um, from Grizzly. If your network, if your uh, cloud infrastructure happens to use Nova Network, you will be unaffected by this because this is a Neutron specific issue. But unfortunately, zero MQ support is not quite where we would love it to be. Because from an HA perspective, having a brokerless peer-to-peer -peer messaging service would solve a lot of issues in one fell swoop. That would be great. OK, we were here. We have covered this. Next slide. All right. And uh, here's uh, sort of a, just to go uh, back to that, that is sort of a standard example of uh, API node HA, the nice thing about uh, the OpenStack API services is that all of them are essentially uh, locally stateless. That is to say they don't write any local data to the node that they are running on. Pretty much all of the data that they need to share with other services that is in some way volatile, that is to say has a, has a lifetime of about 30 seconds or less, uh, typically goes into the the message bus, the AMQP uh, queues, and anything that needs to be volatile goes into, uh, needs to be persistent, goes into the relational database. And there's pretty much nothing that these API services, or very little that these API services actually uh, store locally. So um, in the end, what that means is that in terms of uh, making these services highly available, pretty much the only thing that a uh, high availability manager needs to worry about is keeping these services specifically highly available. So that is to say it keeps tabs on whether a specific API service is running. If it happens to not run because it has crashed or it has run into a problem, uh, what the HA manager, pacemaker, will do is it will uh, attempt to restart the, and recover the resource in place. If that, doesn't fail, if that fails, then we can simply fail over to another node. I saw a hand at the back. Um, so the question was, you're, you're relying on, on layer two VIP failover versus uh, load balancing is actually layer three failover because you, you're failing over IP addresses, not MAC addresses. But what you, you announced that via an ARP broadcast, yes. Um, the, uh, why that and not load balancing? Because a load balancing cluster like HA proxy is great for load balancing. But if you have a service that is actually inherently active-passive, um, such as, for example, if you're using highly available RabbitMQ but without mirror queues, then the load balancing service itself doesn't help you that much. Instead, you can simply fail over the virtual IP address and that's it. Right. Sure, that's another option, yeah. So there's, there's Old Perl saying, right? There's more than one way to do it. Also applies in Python-based projects. <laughs> yes. So in real world, everybody does a load balancing instead of using. What's the point using a pacemaker? 
So the question was, in the real world, everyone does load balancing. What's the point of using Pacemaker these days? Um, yeah, yeah, for this case, I know that. I, I'll dispute the, in the real world, everyone does load balancing, simply because I've seen plenty of projects that use exactly this approach. Um, the question for, for many people that we've worked with um, has been, if I, want, uh, if I need a, fail, a specific failover technology, um, I, or let's put it this way, if I need uh, failover for a set of services and, um, a, uh, and one set of those services mandates or makes necessary one set of failover technology, like Pacemaker, then I can just go ahead and use that same technology for the other services as well, where that is also good enough. Okay? If uh, your entire, if for example, you were building a, a high availability setup that is entirely based on HA proxy, for example, I don't know how you would do that all across the board in OpenStack, but if you did, then it would be perfectly fine to say I'm going to use HA proxy for this as well, or L Director D, or whatever you'd like. But since you're you're already deploying Pacemaker, why not use it for this as well? Because that makes the whole system a little more streamlined. And I saw another hand Ryan. here. <coughs> Um, so the question was about uh, authentication tokens, Keystone authentication tokens. How is that synchronized? It's actually an excellent question. Um, one of the things that uh, happened uh, in the Grizzly release is that uh, we moved by default from token authentication to PKI-based authentication, um, making that fail over in Keystone. And this is exclusively about the Keystone service rather than the other API services. Um, making this fail over uh, requires a certain amount of extra work in my PKI infrastructure. Uh, it requires no extra work if you go back to the token, uh, the UUID-based tokens that we, uh, that we previously had. If you have, uh, and I'm afraid we don't have the time to go into this in much more detail, but please find us afterward if you want to explore, explore this further. Um, I saw another hand up in the front. I would like for us, if possible, to keep rolling because we do need to take the schedule into account um, and we'll be happy to take the questions later. I hope that's okay with everyone or this specific question later if that's okay with everyone. Okay. So there are interesting developments that happen in the compute. That's the NOAA. So in Grizzly, we had NOAA evacuate. So it was like we can evacuate an instance from a dead host to another compute host. And the computer. important part there was yeah. we could ev only evacuate a specific instance. Yes, we can evacuate only one instance. And the thing is that you can only do it from the dead compute node. And it is still the case right now. But what happened in Havana that we got a new feature, the extended version of evacuate that we moved to host, host evacuation. Now you can evacuate an entire host, a dead host, all the virtual machines to another compute node. Which is much more user friendly than having to evacuate, say, 100 machines, 100 guests specifically. One by one. If, one by one, if you can just evacuate the host. Still, uh, the same issue applies that I mentioned in my Portland talk. For those of you who have seen it on YouTube, um, the, the term host evacuation is a bit of a misnomer because if your city is under threat from an incoming typhoon, for example, um, what uh, your, your, your civil defense agency would most likely do is that it would initiate the evacuation before the storm hits, right? And not when the city is already leveled. Uh, whereas what Nova host evacuate really does is you can only evacuate a host that is already down. So in other words, the typhoon has already struck and now you're getting the people out. That's a bit unfortunate in terms of naming, okay? And uh, one thing that we of course would like to see eventually is um, the ability to, while a, uh, while a, a host is uh, acting up, or during um, scheduled maintenance, or for whatever reason, or we want to concentrate nodes, so we, can sh we, we want to concentrate guests, so we can shut off nodes and save energy, um, we would love to see that eventually. And there's actually some pretty interesting work that is happening at SUSE at this time. Um, there is a blog post from Adam Spires from SUSE uh, where he goes into these issues and host evacuation in a lot of detail. Tim, do you happen to have the title of the post handy? Uh, no, but I can try and find it. All right. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, his, his blog is called Structured Procrastination. 
Uh, if you Google for that, you will find them easily. And uh, that has a very interesting recent article on the problem of host evacuation in OpenStack. Another, imp another important. That is an excellent question. The question was, uh, for host evacuation, how do you detect that the host has, in fact, failed? We currently have no automated facility in OpenStack for doing that. So that is the next step. This is an iterative process. We're adding features to OpenStack as we go. Um, and uh, what you have identified is exactly correct. The next thing that we need here is a facility to detect automatically that a host is down, and then we can evacuate it. As of, uh, as of Havana, that is not in OpenStack, but we have already built, or there, there, has, there have been some important stepping stones that have been built for this functionality. And there's another important step stone which um, doesn't seem to do a whole lot of good for us by itself, but lays the groundwork for a fair amount of future work. So uh, there's another, another important um, uh, addition to the NOAA that's query scheduler. Query scheduler is very important because it facilitates a lot of features for guest high availability. So there is a new call that's being added that earlier it used to happen that NOAA used to call scheduler to find a host to spawn an instance. Now a new call has been added that NOAA calls conductor and the conductor queries the scheduler to, to give it a list of hosts. Then it will decide on which host it wants to spawn the instance. And in case of automatic failover, it can also decide to where it can spawn the instance. So, and, so right now, the only thing that we have is this facility to basically ask the scheduler, where would you place this node? Um, and that, of course, is something that comes in extremely handy once we move to automatic host evacuation. Because then, what you really want to do is, I have this list of, say, 20 virtual machines, 20 Nova guests that we now need to mark as failed because the compute node that hosted them um, has failed. And now we need to make sure that we don't overload other nodes um, and we still follow our scheduler hints and we follow our, our, our host aggregates, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that goes into the scheduling decision of where to place a specific VM. And um, that is an important step stone because this feature will eventually enable us to actually ask, hey, Dear Nova, I have a list of 20 uh, virtual machines that I now need to place anew on different hosts, and tell me where, we, where, you, would, uh, where you would place them. And yeah, that is a, a really... It's also very important because it will enable that you now you can, you can implement uh, the, the blueprint and find host and evacuate. It's like relocate an instance and build out on some other compute node, and also automatically uh, scheduling another compute host to rebuilding your instances. And oh, okay, and uh, this is something um, where, again, the situation is kind of unchanged, and I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to take any more questions, otherwise we're going to ruin the schedule here, so we'll be happy to take them later. Um, we uh, still currently don't have any um, evacuation support in Horizon in the OpenStack dashboard. For those of you who are new to OpenStack, that's not necessarily a surprise. Any new feature first goes into the API, then into the CLI tools, and ultimately into the OpenStack dashboard, but Nova Evacuate or Nova Host Evacuate support is not in the dashboard at this time. Networking, OpenStack networking, that's Neutron, and in Neutron we have the similar active passive uh, failover clusters. You can use the same uh, scripts to uh, make your, uh, your Neutron feature, uh, services highly available, like the DHCP agent is already highly available, and uh, your LTE agent, and yeah. Still, as compared to Nova Network, we don't have multi-host feature. So. so for those of you not so familiar with Nova Network, multi-host is, is the ability to run specific network services on the compute node themselves. This is one of the most sought after features in Neutron pretty much since, since, since its inception. So duplicate that functionality for Neutron. We're still not quite there yet, but we're making progress in other fields. And uh, there's going to be a design summit session on improving L3 agent. What we are going to discuss is how to make this virtual routers highly available by, by using Keep Alive and by using Keep Alive and Contract D and VRP protocol, just like 
querying the uh, virtual routers if you're alive. If somebody goes down, then you can fail over to the router. Because uh, currently, uh, L3 agent, you have the uh, scheduler that you can uh, spawn multiple L3 agents on multiple nodes. But if one of the, the nodes goes down and all the virtual machines connected to that, uh, that router goes down, that means you lost connectivity to all those virtual machines. So we are going to have discussions on this. OK, my favorite topic, storage. Um, there's been a few new things that have happened in the storage space. Maybe not really spectacular, but they're kind of nice from the HA perspective. Um, so for example, uh, we now have additional volume options in Cinder that we can use for the GlusterFS and the NFS backends, which is that uh, if a specific uh, host that we uh, connect to, like for example, a Gluster host or an NFS host is unavailable, uh, we can instead try a list of other hosts to connect to. So for those of you familiar with GlusterFS, um, it's completely unimportant which Gluster server I connect to. I can download the vol file from all of them, and then I'll be aware of the uh, entire cluster. So we have these additional volume options here for GlusterFS and NFS. There are other backends where that functionality had already been built in, such as, for example, the Cinder RBD backend using Ceph, because in RBD, um, it is a standard feature that we can tell a client a list of multiple Ceph monitor servers, Ceph mons, and uh, if one of them happens to be uh, inaccessible, then it will try the others in sequence until it finally finds one that works. Global cluster support in, uh, in Swift is uh, something that most of you will have heard in uh, the keynote from Dan Wilson from Concur. Uh, this is a really, really important feature, not so much in the HA space, but really in the DR space, in the disaster recovery space. So having the ability to asynchronously replicate across geographies in Swift was a really, really, really helpful feature for very many users, um, as is evident from uh, Dan's keynote. Stuff that has happened in Heat, a lot of stuff has happened in Heat. It's a new project, uh, a, a newly released project, um, but we're going to talk very briefly about the HA features in Heat. Heat has a certain amount of HA capability built in. Uh, there is a Heat resource called HA Restarter. What we're able to do with that is we can designate uh, individual services running inside an instance uh, that Heat can restart for us when they fail. Uh, we can define high availability for individual instances as well uh, in, in, the, in the definition of a heat stack, beside the fact that in heat we can also do things like auto-scaling and adding new, uh, new guests, uh, new Nova instances as, our, um, as we uh, hit capacity limits. What we can't do as yet is uh, defining high availability for full stacks. So we don't have a way to define in the heat template make this entire stack highly available. So there's a new project, Silometer, that which provides you metering services. It runs uh, a lot of agents on different, com on different types of nodes, like polling agents for a compute node, and then uh, on your con uh, cloud controller node. And uh, for it has a central agent. Central agent is that agent that collects a lot of metering data from your controller node. So that's the problem is with the central agent is that you cannot make it highly available in active active mode. You can make it highly available only in active passive mode. The reason behind that is simple because if you are making it uh, highly available in active active mode, there will be redundant metering messages. Okay, so you can only make it in active passive mode so that you don't have those redundant messages. Otherwise, your, yeah. otherwise you basically get duplicate ticks in yes. your counters and, uh, and gauges, and. OpenStack is an extremely vibrant, and as you, uh, as you saw in, 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 in Brian's and, and Mark's keynote this morning, uh, it is an extremely, insanely fast-growing project uh, with thousands of developers, new features added pretty much on a daily basis. So one thing that we can guarantee you, uh, there's almost certainly stuff in the HA space that we have omitted simply because there's stuff out there that um, are so new that we don't even know about it yet. Uh, because they're just in a develop developer's head, perhaps. Um, and mo more importantly, uh, and more likely, it's just impossible to fit everything into a 40-minute talk. Um, that being said, 
We'll be very happy to field additional questions during the break. Um, if you are willing to forego your lunch, we'll be very honored uh, to help you with that. Um, if you like this talk, it would be great if you could uh, send us a tweet about that. And uh, these slides are available uh, under the CC by SA 3.0 license. You may use them and reuse them for any purpose you wish, um, as long as you quote and attribute your original source. The, um, the, the, the sources here are in uh, Said's uh, GitHub repository, and uh, here's a link to the slides on our website, and that is also the link that you're gonna find uh, on the page where you are able to download um, OpenStack Summit slides. Uh, with that, we thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you for this great turnout. Thanks for uh, coming here and enjoy the rest of the summit. <laughs>